Chapter 36 Warner's gaze is locked on mine, onto mine. He's looking at me, eyes raw with emotion, and I'm not sure I even know him anymore. I'm not sure I understand him. I'm not sure I know what he's going to do when he lifts the gun with a strong, steady hand and points it directly at my face. Hurry up, Anderson says. The sooner you do this, the sooner you can move on. Now get this over with. But Warner cocks his head, turns around, points the gun at his father. I actually gasp. Anderson looks bored, irritated, and annoyed. He runs an impatient hand across his face before he pulls out another gun, my other gun, from his pocket. It's unbelievable. Father and son, both threatening to kill each other. Point the gun in the right direction, Aaron. This is ridiculous. Aaron? I almost laugh in the middle of this insanity. Warner's first name is Aaron. I have no interest in, no interest in killing her, he says to his father. Fine. Anderson points the gun at my head again. I'll do it then. Shoot her, Warner says, and I will put a bullet through your skull. It's a triangle of death. Warner pointing a gun at his father, his father pointing a gun at me. I am the only one without a weapon, and I don't know what to do. If I move, I'm going to die. If I don't move, I'm going to die. Anderson is smiling. How charming, he says. He's wearing an easy, lazy grin, his grip on the gun in his hand so deceptively casual. What is it? Does she make you feel brave, boy? A pause. Does she make you feel strong? Warner says nothing. Does she make you wish you could be a better man? <laughs> As she fills your head with dreams about your future? <laughs> you have lost your mind, he says, over a stupid child who's too much of a coward to defend herself even with the barrel of a gun pointed straight at her face. This, he says, pointing the gun harder in my direction, is the silly little girl you've fallen in love with. I don't know why I'm surprised. A new tightness in his breathing, a new tightness in his grip around the gun in his hand. These are the only signs that Warner is even remotely affected by his father's words. How many times? Anderson asks, have you threatened to kill me? How many times have I woken up in the middle of the night to find you, even as a little boy, trying to shoot me in my sleep? He cocks his head. Ten times? Maybe fifteen? I have to admit, I've lost count. He stares at Warner, smiles again. And how many times, he says, his voice so much louder now, were you able to go through with it? How many times did you succeed? How many times, he says, did you burst into tears apologizing, clinging to me like some demented, shut your mouth, Warner says, his voice, oh, <laughs> it was supposed to be low, <laughs> it was supposed to be a low tone, I apologize, so even, his frame is so s still, it's terrifying, you are weak, Anderson spits, disgusted, too pathetically sentimental, don't want to kill your own father, too afraid it'll break your miserable heart, Warner's jaw tenses. Shoot me, Anderson says, his eyes dancing bright with amusement. I said shoot me, he shouts, this time reaching for Warner's injured arm, grabbing him until his fingers are clenched tight around the wound, twisting his arm back until Warner actually gasps from the pain, blinking too fast, trying desperately to suppress the scream building inside of him. His grip on the gun in his good hand wavers just a little. Anderson releases his son, pushes him so hard that Warner stumbles as he tries to maintain his balance. His face is chalk white. The sling wrapped around his arm is seeping with blood. So much talk, Anderson says, shaking his head. So much talk and never enough follow through. You embarrass me, he says to Warner, face twisted in repulsion. You make me sick. A sharp crack. Anderson backhands Warner in the face so hard. Warner actually sways for a moment, already unsteady from all the blood he's losing, but he doesn't say a word. He doesn't make a sound. He stands there, bearing the pain, blinking fast, jaw so tight, staring at his father with absolutely no emotion on his face. There's no indication he's just been slapped, but the bright red mark across his cheek, his temple, and part of his forehead. But his arm sling is more blood than cotton now, and he looks far too ill to be on his feet. Still, he says nothing. Do you want to threaten me again? Anderson is breathing hard as he speaks. Do you still think you can defend your little girlfriend? You think I'm going to allow your stupid infatuation to get in the way of everything I've built? Everything I've worked toward? Anderson's gun is no longer pointed at me. He forgets me long enough to press the barrel of his gun into Warner's forehead, twisting it, jabbing it against his skin as he speaks. Have I taught you nothing? Have you learned nothing from me? I don't know how to explain what happens next. 
All I know is that my hand is around Anderson's throat, and I've pinned him to the wall, so overcome by a blind, burning, all-consuming rage that I think my brain has already caught on fire and dissolved into ash. I squeeze a little harder. He's sputtering. He's gasping. He's trying to get at my arms, clawing limp hands at my body, and he's turning red and blue and purple, and I'm enjoying it. I'm enjoying it so, so much. I think I'm smiling. I bring my face less than an inch away from his ear and whisper, Drop the gun. He does. I drop him and grab the gun at the same time. Anderson is wheezing, coughing on the floor, trying to breathe, trying to speak, trying to reach for something to defend himself with, and I'm amused by his pain. I'm floating in a cloud of absolute un undiluted hatred for this man and all that he's done, and I want to sit and laugh until the tears choke me into a contented sort of silence. I understand so much now, so much. Juliet. Warner. I say soft, so I say so softly, still staring at Anderson's body slumped on the floor in front of me. I'm going to need you to leave me alone right now. I weigh the gun in my hands, test my finger on the trigger, try to remember what Kenji taught me about taking aim, about keeping my hands and arms steady, preparing for the kickback, the recoil of the shot. I tilt my head, take inventory of his body parts. <sighs> oh. Excuse me. You. Anderson finally manages to gasp. You. I shoot him in the leg. He's screaming. I think he's screaming. I can't really hear anything anymore. My ears feel stuffed full of cotton like someone might be trying to speak to me or maybe someone is shouting at me, but everything is muffled and I have too much to focus on right now to pay attention to whatever annoying things are happening in the background. All I know is the reverberation of this weapon in my hand. All I hear is the gunshot echoing through my head and I decide I'd like to do it again. I shoot him in the other leg. There's so much screaming. I'm entertained by the horror in his eyes. The blood run ruining the expensive fabric of his clothes. I want to tell him he doesn't look very attractive with his mouth open like that. But then I think he probably wouldn't care about my opinion anyway. I'm just a silly girl to him. Just a silly little girl. A stupid child with a pretty face who's too much of a coward, he said. Too much of a coward to defend herself. And oh, wouldn't he like to keep me? Wouldn't he like to keep me as his little pet? And I realized, no, I shouldn't bother sharing my thoughts with him. There's no point wasting words on someone who's about to die. I take aim at his chest, try to remember where the heart is. Not quite to the left, not quite in the center, just there. Perfect. Chapter 37. I am a thief. I stole this notebook and this pen from one of the doctors from one of his lab coats when he wasn't looking, and I shoved them both down my pants. This was just before he ordered those men to come and get me. The ones in the strange suits with the thick gloves and the gas masks with the foggy plastic windows hiding their eyes. They were aliens, I remember thinking. I remember thinking they must have been aliens because they couldn't have been human. The ones who handcuffed my hands behind my back. The ones who strapped me to my seat. They stuck tasers to my skin over and over for no reason other than to hear me scream, but I wouldn't. I whimpered, I whimpered but I never said a word. I felt the tears streak down my cheeks, but I wasn't crying. I think it made them angry. They slapped me awake even though my eyes were open when we arrived. Someone unstrapped me without removing my handcuffs and kicked me in both kneecaps before ordering me to rise, and I tried. I tried, but I couldn't knife, and finally six hands shoved me out the door, and my face was bleeding on the concrete for a while. I can't really remember the part where they dragged me inside. I feel cold all the time. I feel empty, like there is nothing inside of me but this broken heart, the only organ left in the shell. I feel the bleats echo within me. I feel the thump the thumping reverberate around my skeleton. I have a heart, says, says science, but I am a monster, says society. And I know it. Of course I know it. I know what I've done. I'm not asking for sympathy. But sometimes I think, sometimes I wonder, if I were a monster, surely I would feel it by now. How would feel? I would feel angry and vicious and vengeful. I'd know blind rage and bloodlust and a need for vindication. Instead, I feel an abyss within me that's so deep, so dark, I can't see within it. I can't see what it holds. I do not know what I am or what what might happen to me. I do not know what I might do again. Chapter 38 an explosion, the sound of glass shattering. Someone yanks me back just as I pull the trigger, and the bullet hits the window behind Anderson's head. I'm spun around. Kenji is shaking me, shaking me so hard. I feel my head jerk back and forth, and he's screaming at me, telling me we have to go, that I need to drop the gun. He's breathing hard, and he's saying, I'm going to need you to walk away, okay, Juliet? Can you understand me? I need you to back off right now. You're going to be okay. You're going to be all right. You're going to be fine. You just have to... 
No, Kenji. I'm trying to stop him from pulling me away, trying to keep me trying to keep my feet planted where they are because he doesn't understand. He needs to understand. I have to kill him. I have to make sure he dies. I'm telling him. I just need you to give me another second. No, he says. Not yet. Not right now. And he's looking at me like he's about to break, like he's seen something in my face that he wishes he'd never seen. And he says, we can't. We can't kill him yet. It's too soon, okay? But it's not okay, and I don't understand what's happening, but Kenji is reaching for my hand. He's prying the gun out of my fingers I didn't realize were wrapped so tightly around the handle, and I'm blinking. I feel confused and disappointed. I look down at my hands, at my suit, and I can't understand for a moment where all the blood came from. I glance at Anderson. His eyes are rolled back in his head. Kenji is checking his pulse, looks at me, says, I think he fainted. And my body has begun to shake so violently I can hardly stand. What have I done? I back away, needing to find a wall to cling to, something solid to hold onto, and Kenji catches me. He's holding me so tightly with one arm and cradling my head with his other hand, and I feel like I might want to cry, but for some reason I can't. I can't do anything but endure these tremors rocking the length of my entire frame. We have to go, Kenji says to me, stroking my hair in a show of tenderness I know is rare for him. I close my eyes against his shoulder, wanting to draw strength from his warmth. Are you going to be okay? He asked me, I need you to walk with me, all right? We'll have to run, too. Warner, I gasped, ripping out of Kenji's embrace, eyes wild. Where's he's unconscious, a heap on the floor, arms bound behind his back, an empty syringe tossed on the carpet beside him. I took care of Warner, Kenji says. Suddenly, everything is slamming into me all at the same time. All the reasons why we were supposed to be here, what we were trying to accomplish in the first place, the reality of what I've done and what I was about to do. Kenji, I'm gasping. Kenji, where's Adam? What happened? Where are the hostages? Is everyone okay? Adam is fine. He reassures me. We slipped in the back door and found Ian and Emery. He looks toward the kitchen area. They're in pretty bad shape, but Adam's hauling them out, trying to get them to wake up. What about the others? Brendan and Winston. Kenji shakes his head. I have no idea, but I have a feeling we'll be able to get them back. How? Kenji nods at Warner. We're going to take this kid hostage. What? It's our best bet, he says to me. Another trade. A real one this time. Besides, it'll be fine. You take away his guns and this golden boy is harmless. He walks toward Warner's unmoving figure, nudges him with the toe of his boot before hauling him up. Flipping Warner's body over his shoulder, I can't help but notice that Warner's injured arm is now completely soaked through with blood. Come on, Kenji says to me, not unkindly, eyes assessing my frame like he's not sure if I'm stable yet. Let's get out of here. It's insanity out there, and we don't have much time before they move into the street. What? I'm blinking too fast. What do you mean? Kenji looks at me, disbelief written across his features. The war, princess. They're all fighting to the death out there. But Anderson never made the call. He said they were waiting for a word from him. No, Kenji says. Anderson didn't make the call. Castle did. Oh, God. Juliet! Adam is rushing into the house, whipping around to find my face until I run forward and he catches me in his arms without thinking, without remembering that we don't do this anymore, that we're not together anymore, that he shouldn't be touching me at all. You're okay. You're okay. Let's go! Kenji barks for the final time. I know this is an emotional moment or whatever, but we have to get our asses the hell out of here. I swear, Kent. But Kenji stops. Uh, sorry, there was this call. Where was I? His eyes drop. Adam is on his knees, a look of fear and pain and horror and anger and terror etched into every line on his face, and I'm trying to shake him. I'm trying to get him to tell me what's wrong, and he can't move. He's frozen on the ground, his eyes glued to Anderson's body, his hands reaching out to touch the hair that was so perfectly set almost a moment ago, and I'm begging him to speak to me, begging him to tell me what happened, and it's like the world shifts in his eyes, like nothing will ever be right in this world, and nothing can ever be good again, and he parts his lips. He tries to speak. My father, he says. This man is my father. Whoa. Chapter 39. Shit. Kenji presses his eyes shut like he can't believe this is happening. Shit, shit, shit. 
He shifts Warner against his shoulders, wavers between being sensitive and being a soldier, and says, Adam, man, I'm sorry, but we really have to get out of here. Adam gets up, blinking back what I can only imagine are a thousand thoughts, memories, worries, hypotheses. Um, and I call his name, but it's like he can't even hear it. He's confused, disoriented, and I'm wondering how this man could possibly be his father when Adam told me his dad was dead. Now is not the time for these conversations. Something explodes in the distance, and the impact rattles the ground, the windows, the doors of this house, and Adam seems to snap back to reality. He jumps forward, grabs my arm, and we're bolting out the door. Kenji is in the lead, somehow managing to run despite the weight of Warner's body, limp, hanging over his shoulder, and he's shouting at us to stay close behind. I'm spinning, analyzing the chaos around us. The sounds of gunshots are too close, too close, too close. Where are Ian and Emery? I ask Adam, did you get them out? A couple of our guys were fighting not too far from here and managed to commandeer one of the tanks. I got them to carry those two back to point, he tells me, shouting so I can hear him. It was the safest transport possible. I'm nodding, gasping for air as we fly through the streets and I'm trying to focus on the sounds around us, trying to figure out who's winning, trying to figure out if our numbers are, if our numbers have been decimated we round the corner you'd think it's it'd be a massacre 50 of our people are fighting against 500 of anderson's soldiers who are unloading round after round shooting at anything that could possibly be a target castle and the others are holding their ground bloody and wounded but fighting back as best they can our men and women are armed and storming forward to match the shots of the op opposition others are fighting the only way they know how one man has his hands to the ground freezing the earth beneath the soldiers feet causing them to lose balance. Another man is darting through the soldiers with such speed he's nothing but a blur, confusing the men and knocking them down and stealing their guns. I look up and see a woman hiding in a tree, throwing what must be knives or arrows in such rapid succession that the soldiers don't have a moment to react before they're hit from above. Then there's Castle in the middle of it all, his hands outstretched over his head, collecting a whirlwind of particles, debris, um, scattered strips of steel and broken branches with nothing more than the coercion of his fingertips. The others have formed a human wall around him, protecting him as he forms a cyclone of such magnitude that even I can see he's straining to maintain control of it. Then he lets go. The soldiers are shouting, screaming, running back and ducking for cover, but most are too slow to escape the reach of so much destruction, and they're down, impelled by shards of glass and stone and wood and broken metal, but I know this defense won't last for long. Excuse me. Someone has to tell Castle. Someone has to tell him to go, to get out of here, that Anderson is down and that we have two of our hostages and Warner in tow. He has to get our men and women back to Omega Point before the soldiers get smart and someone throws a bomb big enough to destroy everything. Our numbers won't hold up for much longer and this is the perfect opportunity for them to get safe. I tell Adam and Kenji what I'm thinking. But how? Kenji shouts about the chaos. How can we get to him? If we run through there, we're dead. We need some kind of distraction. What? <laughs> I yell back. A distraction, he shouts. We need something to throw off the soldiers long enough for one of us to grab Castle and give him the green light. We don't have much time. Adam is already trying to grab me. He's already trying to stop me. He's already begging me not to do what he thinks I'm going to do, and I tell him it's okay. I tell him not to worry. I tell him to get the others to safety and promise him I'm going to be just fine, but he reaches for me. He's pleading with his eyes, and I'm so tempted to stay here right next to him, but I break away. I finally know what I need to do. I'm finally ready to help. I'm finally kind of a little bit sure that maybe this time I might be able to control it and I have to try. So I stumble back. I close my eyes. I let go. I fall to my knees and press my palm to the ground and feel the power coursing through me. Feel it curdling in my blood and mixing with the anger, the passion, the fire inside of me. And I think of every time my parents called me a monster, a horrible, terrifying mistake. And I think of all the nights I saw myself to sleep and see all the faces that wanted me dead. And then it's like a slight show of images reeling through my mind men and women and children innocent protesters run over in the streets i see guns and bombs a fire and devastation so much suffering 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 and i steal myself i flex my fist i pull back my arm and i shatter what's left of this earth mm -hmm. chapter 40 i'm still here 
I open my eyes and I'm momentarily astonished, confused, half expecting to find myself dead or brain damaged or at the very least mangled on the ground, but this reality refuses to vanish. The world under my feet is rumbling, rattling, shaking, and thundering to life, and my fist is still pressed into the ground and I'm afraid to let go. I'm on my knees, looking up at both sides of the battle, and I see the soldiers slowing down. I see their eyes dart around. I see their feet slipping fail slipping failing to stay standing and the snaps the groans the unmistakable cracks that are now creaking through the middle of the pavement cannot be ignored and it's like the jaws of life are stretching their joints grinding their teeth yawning themselves awake to witness our disgrace the ground looks around its mouth gaping open at the injustice the violence the calculated ploys for power that stop for no one and nothing and are sated only by the blood of the weak the screams of the unwilling it's as if the earth thought to take a peek at what we've been doing all this time and is terrifying just now, just how disappointed it sounds. Adam is running. He is dashing through a crowd, still gasping for air and an explanation for the earthquake under their feet, and he tackles Castle. He pins him down. He's shouting to the men and the women, and he ducks. He dodges a stray bullet. He pulls Castle to his feet, and our people have begun to run. The soldiers on the opposite side are stumbling over each other in tripping into a tangle of limbs as they try to outrun one another and excuse me and i'm wondering how much longer i have to hold on how much longer this must go on before it's sufficient and kenji shouts juliet and i spin around just in time to hear him tell me to let go so i do the wind, the trees, the fallen leaves all slip and slide back into place with one giant inhalation and everything stops and for a moment I can't remember what it's like to live in a world that isn't falling apart. Kenji yanks me up by the arm and we're running. We're the last of our group to leave and he's asking me if I'm okay and I'm wondering how he's still carrying Warner. I'm thinking Kenji must be a hell of a lot stronger than he looks and I'm thinking I'm too hard on him sometimes. I'm thinking I don't give him enough credit. I'm just beginning to realize that he's one of my favorite people on this planet and I'm so happy he's okay. I'm so happy he's my friend. I cling to his hand and let him lead me toward a tank abandoned on our side of the divide and suddenly I realize I can't see Adam. That I don't know where he's gone and I'm frantic. I'm screaming his name until I feel his arms around my waist, his words in my ear. And we're still diving for cover as the final shots sound in the distance. We clamber into the tank. We close the doors. We disappear. Chapter 41 Warner's head is in my lap. His face is smooth and calm and peaceful in a way I've never seen it, and I almost reach out to stroke his hair before I remember exactly how awkward this actually is. I look to my right. Warner's legs are resting on Adam's knees, and he looks just as uncomfortable as I am. Hang tight, guys. Hang tight, guys, Kenji says, still driving the tank toward Omega Point. I know this is about a million different kinds of weird, but I didn't exactly have enough time to think of a better plan. He glances at the three of us, but no one says a word until I'm so happy you guys are okay. I say it like those nine syllables have been sitting inside of me for too long, like they've been kicked out, evicted from my mouth, and only then do I realize um, exactly how worried I was that the three of us wouldn't make it back alive. I'm so, so happy you're okay. Deep, solemn, steady breathing all around. How are you feeling? Adam asked me, your arm, you're all right? Yeah, I flex my wrist and try not to wince. I'm okay. These gloves and this metal thing actually helped, I think. I wiggle my fingers, examine my gloves. Nothing is broken. That was pretty badass, Kenji says to me. You really saved us back there. I shake my head. Kenji, about what happened in the house. I'm really sorry. I, hey, how about let's not talk about that right now? What's going on? Adam asks the word. What happened? Nothing, Kenji says quickly. Adam ignores him, looks at me. What happened? Are you all right? I just, I j just, I struggle to speak. What happened with Warner's d Kenji swears very loudly. My mouth freezes mid-movement. My cheeks burn as I realize what I've done, what I've said. As I remember what Adam said just before we ran from that house, he suddenly pale, pressing his lips together and looking away out the tiny window of his tank. Listen, <clears throat> we don't have to talk about that, okay? In fact, I think I might rather not talk about that because that shit is just too weird for me to... I don't... I don't know how it's even possible. Adam whispers. He's blinking, staring straight ahead. Now, blinking and blinking and blinking. And I keep thinking i must be dreaming he says that i'm just hallucinating this whole thing but then 
He drops his head in his hands, laughs a harsh laugh. That is one face I will never forget. Didn't, didn't you ever meet the Supreme Commander? I dare to ask. Or even see a picture of him? Isn't that something you'd see in the army? Adam shakes his head. Kenji speaks. His whole kick was always being like invisible. He got some sick thrill out of being this unseen power. Fear of the unknown? Something like that, yeah. I heard he didn't want his pictures anywhere. I didn't make any public speeches either because he thought if people could put a face on him, it would make him vulnerable, human. And he always got his thrills from scaring the shit out of everyone, being the ultimate power, the ultimate threat. Like, how can you fight something if you can't even see it, can't even find it? That's why it's such a big deal for him to be here, I realize out loud, pretty much. But you thought your dad was dead, I say to Adam. I thought you said he was dead. Just so you guys know, Kenji interjects, I'm still voting for the we don't have to talk about this option, you know, just so you know, just putting that out there. I thought he was, Adam says, still not looking at me. That's what they told me. Who did? Kenji asks, catches himself, winces, shit. Fine. Fine. I'm curious. Adam shrugs. It's all starting to come together now. All the things I didn't understand. How messed up my life was with James. After my mom died, my dad was never around unless he wanted to get drunk and beat the crap out of someone. I guess he was living a completely different life somewhere else. That's why he used to leave me and James all alone all the time. But that doesn't make sense, Kenji says. I mean, not the parts about your dad being a dick, but just, like, the whole scope of it. Because if you and Warner are brothers, and you're 18, and Warner is 19, and Anderson has always been married to Warner's mom, my parents were never married, Adam says, eyes widening as he speaks the last word. You were the love child, Kenji says, disgusted. I mean, you know, no offense to you, it's just I do not want to think about Anderson having some kind of passionate love affair. That's just sick. Adam looks... Like he's been frozen solid. Holy shit, he whispers. But I mean, why even have a love affair? Kenji asks. I never understood that kind of crap. If you're not happy, just leave. Don't cheat. It doesn't take a genius to figure that shit out. I mean, he hesitates. I'm assuming it was a love affair, Kenji says, still driving and unable to see the look on Anna's face. Maybe it wasn't a love affair. Maybe it was just another dude being a jackass kind of the... He catches himself, cringes, shit. See, this is why I do not talk to people about their personal problems. It was, Adam says, barely breathing now. I have no idea why he never married her, but I know he loved my mom. He never gave a damn about the rest of us, he says. Just her. It was always about her. Everything was about her. The few times a month he was ever at home, I was always supposed to stay in my room. I was supposed to to be very quiet. I had to knock on my own door and get permission before I could come out, even just to use the bathroom. And he used to get pissed whenever my mom would let me out. He didn't want to see me unless he had to. My mom had to sneak me my dinner just so he wouldn't go nuts about how she was feeding me too much and not saving anything for herself, he says. He shakes his head. And he was even worse when James was born. Adam blinks like he's going blind. And then when she died, he says, taking a breath, when she died, all he ever did was blame me for her death. He always told me it was my fault she got sick and it was my fault she died, that I needed too much, that she didn't eat enough, that she got weak because she was too busy taking care of us, giving us, giving food to us, giving everything to us, to me and James. His eyebrows pulled together. And I believed him for so long. I figured that was why he left all the time. I thought it was some kind of a some kind of punishment i thought i deserved it i'm too horrified to speak and then he just i mean he was never around when i was growing up adam says and he was always an asshole but after she died he just lost his mind he used to come by just to get pissed drunk he used to force me to stand in front of him so he could throw his empty bottles at me and if i flinched if i flinched he swallows hard that's all he ever did adam says his voice quieter now he would come over get drunk beat the shit out of me. I was 14 when he stopped coming back. Adam stares at his hands, palms up. He sent, he sent some money every month for us to survive on, and then a pause. Two years later, I got a letter from our brand new government telling 
me, my father was dead. I figured he probably got wasted again and did something stupid. Got hit by a car, fell into the ocean, whatever. It didn't matter. I was happy he was dead, but I had to drop out of school. I enlisted because the money was gone and I had to take care of James and I knew I wouldn't find another job. Adam shakes his head. He left us with nothing, not a single penny, not even a piece of meat to live off of. And now I'm sitting here in this tank, running from a global war my own father has helped orchestrate. He laughs a hard, hollow laugh. And the one other worthless person on this planet is lying unconscious in my lap. Adam is actually laughing now, laughing hard, disbelieving, his hand caught in his hair, tugging at the roots, gripping his skull. And he's my brother. My own flesh and blood. My father had an entirely separate life I didn't know about, and instead of being dead like he should be, he gave me a brother who almost tortured me to death in a slaughterhouse. He runs an unsteady hand over the length of his of this of his face, suddenly cracking, suddenly slipping, suddenly losing control, and his hands are shaking, and he has to curl them into fists, and he presses them against his forehead and says, He has to die. And I'm not breathing, not even a little bit, not even at all. When he says, my father, he says, I have to kill him. Wow. And then chapter 42 is, there's words there, but there's all lines through it. And I always just skip that part. So we're, <laughs> we're moving on to chapter 43. I don't even know where to begin. Adam's pain is like a handful of straw shoved down my throat. He has no parents but a father who beat him, abused him, abandoned him only to ruin the rest of the world and left him a brand new brother who is exactly his opposite in every possible way. Warner, whose first name is no longer a mystery. Adams, whose last name isn't actually Kent. Kent is his middle name, Adams said to me. He said he didn't want to have anything to do with his father and never told people his real last name. He has that much, at least, in common with his brother. That, and the fact that both of them have some kind of immunity to my touch. Adam and Aaron Anderson, brothers. I'm sitting in my room, sitting in the dark, struggling to reconcile Adam with his new sibling, who is really nothing more than a boy. A child who hates his father, and as a result, a child who made a series of very unfortunate decisions in life. Two brothers, two very different sets of choices, two very different lives. Castle came to me this morning, now that all the injured have been set up in the medical wing and the insanity has subsided. He came to me and he said, Miss Ferrars, you were very brave yesterday. I wanted to extend my gratitude to you and thank you for what you did, for showing your support. I don't know that we would have made it out of there without you. I smiled, struggled to swallow the compliment and assumed he was finished, but then he said, In fact, I'm so impressed that I'd like to offer you your first official assignment at Omega Point. My first official assignment. Are you interested? He asked. I said, yes, 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 of course, I was interested. I was definitely interested. I was so very, very interested to finally have something to do, something to accomplish. And he smiled and he said, I'm so happy to hear it because I can't think of anyone better suited to this particular position than you. I beamed. The sun and the moon and the stars called and said, turn down the beaming, please, because you're making it hard for us to see. And I didn't listen. I just kept on beaming. And then I asked Castle for the details of my official assignment, the one perfectly suited to me. And he said, I'd like you to be in charge of maintaining it and, and interrogating our new visitor. And I stopped beaming. I stared at Castle. I will, of course, be overseeing the entire process, Castle continued. So feel free to come to me with questions and concerns, but we'll need to take advantage of his presence here, and that means trying to get him to speak. Castle was quiet a moment. He seems to have an odd sort of attachment to you, Miss Ferrars, and forgive me, but I think it would behoove us to exploit it. I don't think we can offer I don't think we can afford the luxury of ignoring any possible advantages available to us. Anything he could tell us about his father's plans or where our hostages might be will be invaluable to our efforts and we don't have much time, he said. I'm afraid I'll need you to get started right away. And I asked the world to open up. I said, "World, please open up because I'd love to fall into a river of magma and die just a little bit." But the world couldn't hear me because Castle was still talking and he said, Perhaps you can talk some sense into him, tell him we're not interested in hurting him, convince him to help us get our remaining hostages back. I said, oh, I said, surely he's, he's some kind of holding cell behind bars or something. But Castle laughed. 
amused by my sudden unexpected hilarity and said, don't be silly, Miss Ferrars. We don't have anything like that here. I never thought we'd need to keep anyone captive at Omega, at Omega Point, but yes, um, he's in his own room and yes, the door is locked. So you want me to go inside of his room? I asked with him alone. <laughs> calm. Of course I was calm. I was definitely absolutely everything that is the opposite of calm. But then Castle's forehead tightened, concerned. Is that a problem? He asked me. I thought, because he can't touch you, I actually thought you might not feel as threatened by him as the others do. He's aware of your abilities, is he not? I imagine he would be wise to stay away from you for his own benefit. And it was funny because there it was, a vat of ice all over my head, dripping, leaking, seeping into my bones, and actually, no, it wasn't funny at all because I had to say, yes, right, uh, yes, of course, I almost forgot. Of course he wouldn't be able to touch me. You're quite right, Mr. Castle, sir. What on earth was I thinking? Castle was relieved, so relieved, as if he'd taken a dip in a warm pool he was sure would be frozen. And now I'm here, sitting in exactly the same position I was in two hours ago, and I'm beginning to wonder how much longer I can keep the secret to myself. Chapter 44 This is the door. This one, right in front of me, this is where Warner is staying. There are no windows, and there is no way to see inside of his room, and I'm starting to think that this situation is the exact antonym of excellent yes i am going to walk into his room completely unarmed because the guns are buried deep down in the armory and because i'm lethal so why would i need a gun no one is there no one in their right mind would lay a hand on me no one but warner of course whose half crazed attempt at stopping me from escaping out of my window resulted in this discovery his discovery that he can touch me without harming himself and i said a word of this to exactly no one I really thought that perhaps I'd imagined it, just until Warner kissed me and told me he loved me, and then that's when I knew I could no longer pretend this wasn't happening. But it's only been about four weeks since that day, and I didn't know how to bring it up. I thought maybe I wouldn't have to bring it up. I really quite desperately didn't want to bring it up. And now the thought of telling anyone, of making it known to Adam, of all people, that the one person he hates most in this world, second only to his own father, is the one other person who can touch me, that Warner has already touched me, that his hands have known the shape of my body and his lips have known the taste of my mouth, never mind that it wasn't something I actually wanted. I just can't do it. Not now. Not after everything. So the situation is entirely my own fault and I have to deal with it. I steal myself and step forward. There are two men I've never met before standing guard outside Warner's door. This doesn't mean much, but it gives me a modicum of calm. I nod hello in the guard's direction and they greet me with such enthusiasm I actually wonder whether they've confused me with someone else. Thanks so much for coming, one of them says to me, his long, shaggy blonde hair slipping into his eyes. He's been completely insane since he woke up, throwing things around and trying to destroy the walls. He's been threatening to kill all of us. He says you're the only one he wants to talk to and he's only just calmed down because he because we told him you were on your way. We had to take out all the furniture, the other guard adds, his brown eyes wide and credulous. He was breaking everything. It wouldn't, he wouldn't even eat the food we gave him. The antonym of excellent, the antonym of excellent, the antonym of excellent. I manage a feeble smile and tell them I'll see what I can do to sedate him. They nod, eager to believe I'm capable of something I know I'm not, and they unlock the door. Just knock to let us know when you're ready to leave, they tell me. Call for us and we'll open the door. I'm nodding yes and sure, of course, and trying to ignore the fact that I'm more nervous right now than I was meeting his father. To be alone in a, in a room with Warner, to be alone with him and to not know what he might do or what he's capable of, and I'm so confused because I don't even know who he is anymore. He's 100 different people. He's the person who forced me to torture a toddler against my will. He's the child so terrorized, so 
psychologically tormented that he tried to kill his own father in his sleep. He's the boy who shot a defecting soldier in the forehead. The boy who was trained to be a cold, heartless murderer by a man he thought he could trust. I see Warner as a child desperately seeking his dad's approval. I see him as the leader of an entire sector, eager to conquer me, to use me. I see him feeding a stray dog. I see him torturing Adam almost to death. And then I hear him telling me he loves me. Tell him kissing me with such unexpected passion and desperation that I don't know, I don't know, I don't know what I'm walking into. I don't know who he'll be this time, which side of himself he'll show me today. And then I think this must be different because he's in my territory now and I can always call for help if something goes wrong. He's not going to hurt me, I hope. Chapter 45. I step inside. The door slams shut behind me, but the Warner I find inside this room is not one I recognize at all. He is sitting on the floor, back against the wall, legs outstretched in front of him, feet crossed at the ankles. He is wearing nothing but socks, a simple white t-shirt, and a pair of black slacks. His coat, his shoes, and his fancy shirt are all discolored on the ground. His body is toned and muscular and hardly contained by his undershirt. His hair is a blonde mess, disheveled for what's probably the first time in his life. But he's not looking at me. He doesn't even look up as I take a step closer. He doesn't flinch. I've forgotten how to breathe again. Ben, do you have any idea? He says so quietly. How many times I've read this? He lifts his hand, but not to not his head, and holds up a small, faded rectangle between the two fingers. And I'm wondering how it's possible to be punched in the gut by so many fists at the same time. My notebook. He's holding my notebook. Of course he is. I can't believe I've forgotten. He was the last person to, to touch my notebook, the last person to see it. He took it from me when he found that I'd hidden it in the pocket of my dress back on the base. This was just before I escaped, just before Adam and I jumped out the window and ran away, just before Warner realized he could touch me. And now, to know that he's read my most painful thoughts, my most anguished confessions, the things I wrote while incomplete in utter isolation, certain that I would die in that very cell, so certain no one would ever read the things I wrote down, to know that he's read these desperate whispers of my private mind. I feel absolutely unbearably naked, petrified, so vulnerable. He flips the notebook open at random, scans the page until he stops. He finally looks up, his eyes sharper, brighter, a more beautiful shade of green than they've ever been, and my heart is beating so fast I can't even feel it anymore. And he begins to read. No, I gasp, but it's too late. I sit here every day, he says. 175 days I've sat here so far. Some days I stand up and stretch and feel these stiff bones, these creaky joints, this trampled spirit cramped inside my, my being. I roll my shoulders, I blink my eyes, I count the seconds creeping up the walls, the minutes shivering under my skin, the breaths I have to remember to take. Sometimes I allow my mouth to drop open just a little bit. I touch my tongue to the backs of my teeth and the seam of my lips, and I walk around this small space. I, tra I trail my fingers along the cracks in the concrete and wonder. I wonder what it would be like to speak out loud and be heard. I hold my breath, listen closely for anything, any sound of life, and wonder at the beauty, the impossibility of possibly hearing another person breathing beside me. He presses the back of his fist to his mouth for just a moment before continuing. I stop. I stand still. I close my eyes and try to remember a world beyond these walls. I wonder what it would be like to know that I'm not dreaming, that this is, that this isolated existence is not caged within my own mind. And I do, he says, reciting the words from memory now, his head resting back against the wall, eyes pressed as shut as he whispers. I do wonder. I think about it all the time. What it would be like to kill myself, because I never really know. I still can't tell the difference. I'm never quite certain whether or not I'm actually alive, so I sit here. I sit here every single day. I'm rooted to the ground, frozen in my own skin, and unable to move forward or backward for fear of waking up and realizing that this is actually happening. I feel like I might die of embarrassment of this invasion of privacy, and I want to run, 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 and run, and run, run, I said to myself. Warner has picked up my notebook again. Please, I'm begging him. Please stop. He looks up at me. he looks up, looks at me like he can really see me, see into me, like he wants me to see into him, and then he drops his eyes. He clears his throat. He starts over. He reads from my journal. Run, I said to myself. Run until your lungs collapse, until the wind whips and snaps at your tattered clothes, until you until you're a blur that blends into the background. Run, Juliet. Run faster. Run until your bones break and 
your shin split and your muscles atrophy and your heart dies because it was always too big for your chest and it beat too fast for too long and run 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 until you can't hear their feet behind you run until they drop their fists and their shouts dissolve in the air run with your eyes open and your mouth shut and damn the river rushing up behind your eyes run juliet run until you drop make sure your heart stops before they ever reach you before they ever touch you run i said i have to clench my fists until i feel pain anything to push these memories away i don't want to remember i don't want to think about these things anymore i don't want to think about what else i wrote on those pages and what else Warner knows about me now? What he must think of me? I can only imagine how pathetic and lonely and desperate I must appear to him. Do you know, he says, closing the book, the cover of the journal only to lay his hand on top of it, protecting it, staring at it. I couldn't sleep for days after I read that entry. I kept wanting to know which people were chasing you down the street, who it was you were running from. I wanted to find them, he said, he says so softly. And I wanted to rip their limbs off, one by one. I wanted to murder them in ways that would horrify you to hear. I'm shaking now, whispering, please, please give that back to me. He touches the tips of his fingers to, my, to his lips, tilts his head back just a little, smiles a strange, unhappy smile, says, You must know how sorry I am that I, he swallows, that I kissed you like that. I confess I had no idea you would shoot me for it. And I realized something. Your arm. I breathe, astonished. He wears no sling. He moves with no difficulty. There's no bruising or swelling or scars I can see. His smile is brittle. Yes, he says. It was healed when I woke up to find myself in this room. Sonia and Sarah, they helped him. I wonder why anyone here would do him such a kindness. I force myself to take a step back. Please, I tell him. My notebook, I... I promise you, he says, I never would have kissed you if I didn't think you wanted me to. And I'm so shocked that for a moment I forget all about my notebook. I meet his heavy gaze, manage to steady my voice. I told you I hated you. Yes, he says. He nods. Well, you'd be surprised how many people say that to me. I don't think I would. His lips twitch. You tried to kill me. That amuses you? Oh, yes. He says, his grinning growing. I find it fascinating. A pause. Would you like to know why? I stare at him. Because all you ever said to me, he explains, was that you didn't want to hurt anyone. You didn't want to murder people. I don't. Except for me. I'm all out of letters, fresh out of words. Someone has robbed me of my entire vocabulary. That decision was so easy for you to make, he says. So simple. You had a gun. You wanted to run away. You pulled the trigger. That was it. He's right. I keep telling myself I have no interest in killing people, but somehow I find a way to justify it, to rationalize it when I want to. Warner, Castle, Anderson. I wanted to kill every single one of them, and I would have. What is happening to me? I've made a huge mistake coming here, accepting this assignment, because I can't be alone with Warner. Not like this. Being alone with him is making my insides hurt in ways I don't want to understand. I have to leave. Don't go, he whispers, eyes on my notebook again. Please, he says. Sit with me. Stay with me. I just want to see you. You don't even have to say anything. Some crazed, confused part of my brain actually wants to sit down next to him, actually wants to hear what he has to say before I remember Adam and what he would think if he knew, what he would say if he were here and could see I was interested in spending my time with the same person who shot him in the leg, broke his ribs, and hung him on a cover conveyor belt in an abandoned slaughterhouse, leaving him to bleed to death one minute at a time. I must be insane. Still, I don't move. Warner relaxes against the wall. Would you like to read to what would you like me to read to you? I'm shaking my head over and over and over again, whispering. Why are you doing this to me? And he looks like he's about to respond before he changes the mind his mind. Looks away, lifts his eyes to the ceiling and smiles just a tiny bit. You know, he says, I could tell the very first day I met you. There was something about you that felt different to me. Something in your eyes that was so tender, raw, like you hadn't yet learned how to hide your heart from the world. He's nodding now, nodding to himself about something and I can't imagine what it is. Find this, he says, his voice soft as he pats the cover of my notebook. Was so, his eyebrows pulled together. It was so extraordinarily painful. 
he finally looks at me and he looks like a completely different person. Like he's trying to solve a tremendously difficult equation. It was like meeting a friend for the very first time. He takes a deep breath, looks down, whispers, I'm so tired, love. I'm so very, very tired. How much time, he says after a moment, do I have before they kill me? Kill you? He stares at me. I'm startled and speaking. We're not going to kill you, I tell him. We have no intention of hurting you. We just want to use you to get back our men. We're holding you hostage. Warner's eyes go wide, his shoulders stiffen. What? We have no reason to kill you, I explain. We only need to barter with your life. <laughs> Warner laughs, a loud, full-bodied laugh. Shakes his head, smiles at me in that way I've only ever seen once before, looking at me like I'm the sweetest thing he's ever decided to eat. Dear, sweet, beautiful girl, he says. Your team here has greatly overestimated my father's affection for me. I'm sorry to have to tell you this, but keeping me here is not going to give you the advantage you were hoping for. I doubt my father has even noticed I'm gone. So I would like to request that you please either kill me or let me go. But I beg you not to waste my time by confining me here. I'm checking my pockets for spare words and sentences, but I'm finding none. Not an adverb, not a, pre not a preposition, or even a dangling particle, because there doesn't exist a single response to such an outlandish request. Warner is still smiling at me, shoulders shaking in silent amusement. But that's not even a viable argument, I tell him. No one likes to be held hostage. He takes a tight breath, runs a hand through his hair, shrugs. Your men are wasting their time, he says. Kidnapping me will never work to your advantage. This much, he says, I can guarantee. Chapter 46. Time for lunch. Kenji and I <laughs> are sitting on one side of the table, Adam and James on the other. We've been sitting here for half an hour now, deliver deliberating over my conversation with Warner. I conveniently left other parts about my journal, though I'm starting to wonder if I should have mentioned it. I'm also starting to wonder if I should just come clean about Warner being able to touch me. But every time I look at Adam, I just can't bring myself to do it. I don't even know why Warner can touch me. Maybe Warner is the fluke I thought Adam was. Maybe all of this is some kind of cosmic joke told I'm told at my expense. I don't know what to do yet. But somehow the extra details of my conversation with Warner seem too personal, too embarrassing to share. I don't want anyone to know, for example, that Warner told me he loves me. I don't want anyone to know that he has my journal or that he reads it or that he's read it. Adam is the only other person who even knows it exists, and he, at least, was kind enough to respect my privacy. He's the one who saved my journal from the asylum, the one who brought it back to me in the first place, but he said he never read the things I wrote. He said he knew they must have been very private thoughts and that he didn't want to intrude. Warner, on the other hand, has ransacked my mind. I feel so much more apprehensive around him now. Just thinking about being near him makes me feel anxious, nervous, so vulnerable. I, th I hate that he knows my secrets, my secret thoughts. It shouldn't be him who knows anything about me at all. It should be him. The one sitting right across from me. The one with the dark blue eyes and the dark brown hair and the hands that have touched my heart, my body. And he doesn't seem okay right now. Adam's head is down, his eyebrows drawn. His hands clenched together on the table. He hasn't touched his food and he hasn't said a word since I summarized my meeting with Warner. Kenji has been just as quiet. Everyone's been a bit more solemn since our recent battle. <coughs> Excuse me. We lost several people from Omega Point. I take a deep breath and try again. So what do you think? I ask them. How about... Uh, what about... About what he said about Anderson... I'm careful not to use the word dad or father anymore, especially around James. I don't know what, if anything, Adam has said to James about the issue, and it's not my business to pry. Worse still, Adam hasn't said a word about it since we got back, and it's already been two days. Do you think he's right that Anderson won't care if he's been taken hostage? James squirms around his seat, eyes narrowed as he chews the food in his mouth, looking at the group of us like he's waiting to memorize everything we say. Adam rubs his forehead. That, he finally says, might actually have some merit. Kenji frowns, folds his arms, leans forward. Yeah, it is kind of weird. We haven't heard a single thing from their side, and it's been over 48 hours. What does Castle think? I ask. Kenji shrugs. He's stressed out. Ian and Emery were 
really messed up when we found them. I don't think they're conscious yet, even though Sonya and Sarah have been working around the clock to help them. I think he's worried we won't get Winston and Brennan back at all. Maybe, Adam says. Their silence has to do with the fact that you shot Anderson in both his legs. Maybe he's just recovering. I almost choke on the water I was attempting to drink. I chance a look at Kenji to see if he's going to correct Adam's assumption, but he doesn't even flinch. So I say nothing. Kenji is nodding. Says, right. Yeah, I almost forgot about that. I pause. Makes sense. You shot him in the legs? James asks, eyes wide in Kenji's direction. Kenji clears his throat, but he but is careful not to look at me. I wonder why he's protecting me from this. Why he thinks it's better not to tell the truth about what really happened. Yup, he says, and takes a bite of his food. Adam exhales and pushes up his shirt sleeves, studies the series of constant con concentric circles inked onto his forearms, military momentums, mom mementos of his past life. But why? James asked Kenji. Why what, kid? Why didn't you kill him? Why just shoot him in the, in the legs? Didn't you say he's the worst? The reason why we have all the problems we have now? Kenji is quiet for a, mom a moment. He's gripping his spoon, poking at his food. Finally, he puts the spoon down. Motions for James to join him on our side of the table. I slide down to make room. Come here, he says to James, pulling him tight against the right side of his body. James wraps his arms around Kenji's waist, and Kenji drops his hand on James's head, mussing his hair. I had no idea they were so close. I keep forgetting that the three of them are roommates. So, okay, you ready for a little lesson? He says to James. James nods. It's like this. Castle always teaches us that we can't just cut off the head, you know. He hesitates, collects his thoughts. Like, if we just kill the enemy leader, then what? What would happen? World peace? James says. Wrong. It would be mass chaos. Kenji shakes his head, rubs the tips of his rubs the tip of his nose and chaos is a hell of a lot harder to fight then how do you win right kenji says well that's the thing we can only take out the leader of the opposition when we're ready to take over only when there's a new leader ready to take the place of the old one people need someone to rally around right and we're not ready he shrugs this was supposed to be a fight against Warner. Taking him out wouldn't have been an issue, but to take out Anderson would be asking for absolute anarchy all over the country. And anarchy means there's a chance someone else, someone even worse possibly, could take control before we do. James, James says something in response, but I don't hear it. Adam is staring at me. He's staring at me and he's not pretending not to. He's not looking away. He's not saying a word. His gaze moves from my eyes to my mouth, focusing on my lips for a moment too long. Finally, he turns away just for a brief second before his eyes are fixed on mine again, deeper, hungrier. My heart is starting to hurt. I watch the hard movement in his throat, the rise and fall of his chest, the tense line of his jaw, and the way he's sitting so perfectly still. He doesn't say anything, anything at all. Smart ass. Kenji is chuckling, shaking his head as he reacts to something James just said. You know that's not what I meant. Anyway, we're not ready to deal with that kind of insanity just yet. We take out Anderson when we're ready to take over. That's the only way to do this right. Adam stands abruptly. He pushes away his untouched bowl of food and clears his throat. Looks at Kenji. So that's why you didn't kill him when he was right in front of you. Kenji scratches the back of his head, uncomfortable. Listen, man, if I had any idea, forget it. Adam cuts him off. You did me a favor. What do you mean? Kenji asks. Hey, man, where are you going? But Adam is already walking away.